We read this morning, well, really verse 19 to verse 35. I just love that verse 18. <coughs> it's such a, a beautiful thing to contemplate, but we'll, we'll not go there this morning. We're going to look at this reply of the Jerusalem church to the church in Antioch. And as I, I studied it, what, what has struck me most especially is the way that the, the gospel has such a gracious effect on men and women. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the gospel of grace, God's mercy towards us, undeserved. What I was struck with as I studied this passage is the power of the gospel then to make believers and men and women gracious toward one another. You remember when the Saviour was asked what was the chief commandment, he was very quick to reply, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and then without breaking breath. And the second is, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. And that then becomes the new commandment. It's tragic, really, looking back on history, to perceive how much that's been ignored. And chapters like this should have the effect on us that they make us come back to this very important basic. We've been so used to division, hundreds of different denominations and groups, that we forget that we are actually, if true believers, all one together in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter our country, our continent, our background, if you truly are resting in Christ, there's a unity which is greater than everything that divides us. And that, I believe, is right here in the passage in front of us. One man illustrated the church as being like a jigsaw puzzle. Every part is different, that every part is necessary. And all together, they make something that's beautiful. That's our God's purpose in his church. I want to look at this subject of the gracious gospel in three senses. First of all, the conviction that unites us. The, the pattern of self-denial that is to distinguish us. And then, thirdly, the delight that comes from the privilege of being a believer in Jesus. So that's the conviction that unites. The self-denial that's for all of us. And the delight or the joy that is ours because we are in Christ. I hope to show you that all three of them are in the passage in front of us. Let's look then initially at the conviction. We have broken into a narrative. If you remember what happened was some men went to Antioch and they insisted that before Gentiles could become Christians they needed to become Jews. That meant circumcision. That meant keeping Mosaic laws. And the church in Antioch then send Barnabas and Paul back to the church in Jerusalem to see if they can get some insight into why this has been done. And so they report, as I said last week, all the great things that God has been doing. How the Lord has been saving men and women. Verse 8, so God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. You see, this is the uniformity of the gospel. That there's a work of God in the individual's life. It's not simply that we have a, a social connection. The thing that connects us is that God has transformed us by his grace. And that grace becomes gracious. The man who is speaking in the passage that we were reading is James, the Lord Jesus' half-brother. Who initially a skeptic has become a believer and is now quite clearly a leader in the church in Jerusalem. And as he comes to think through and listen to what's been said by Peter, by Barnabas and Paul, and then as the Lord lays Old Testament scripture on his heart, he's absolutely convinced that Gentiles do not need to become Jews before they can become Christians. There's no need for circumcision. There's no need for them to assume all the Mosaic laws. And remember, for, for first century Judaism, that wasn't just the Ten Commandments. That was 600 plus rules and regulations that the Jews had put together. So James is speaking as a church leader. 
And he makes this very important statement. Therefore, that's as a result of what's gone before, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. The evidence has been examined. It's now time for a conclusion. A conclusion which has been the result of the leaders of the church talking and the congregation is quite clearly involved if you study the passage. Verse 28 though makes a very important statement. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Earlier on in chapter 13, the, the church at Antioch had separated Paul and Barnabas for the work of the gospel because the Holy Spirit led them to do that. It wasn't that they would get a voice from heaven or an apparition or a manifestation. It would be quite simply that there would be a growing conviction based on the word amongst the people of God and they would agree because that's how the, the church since Pentecost knows the mind of the Holy Spirit. We have the scriptures but the, there are aspects of the scriptures which need to be applied to our lives and each individual being filled with the Holy Spirit and dwelt with the Spirit becomes part of the body of Christ and together they come to this lovely gracious teaching if you look at verse 22 then it pleased the apostles that's peter and co and the elders that's john that's james and co and the whole church so you have this lovely picture of what in modern terminology is called congregationalism it's called congregational worship it's a community we're together there's nobody that's superfluous all of us are part of the church peter sorry james is quite clear therefore i judge that we should not trouble those from among the gentiles and this is a phrase that i want to just focus on who are turning to god who are turning to god that phrase is a very biblical phrase it's often used as the word repent or repentance and what James can see from what has happened, from the life of the people that Paul and Barnabas have brought with them, from the reports of what has been happening in Antioch, that people have been turning to God. And one of the things I've enjoyed about chapter 15 is the way that this theme is continually being rehearsed. Go back to verse 3. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing, do you notice it in your book? The conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy to all the brethren. What makes a church? What identifies a true believer? There has been a complete revolution in their lives. In the New Testament, there are three different words used to describe this they're all translated as a form of repentance but without piling up verses let me just explain to you that those three words describe the revolution which takes place in an unbeliever's life when they recognize that they are sinners that God has provided a savior and they flee to him one of them describes a change of mind it means they now suddenly think differently you think differently because you've been given information and the Holy Spirit has applied it. Another one describes a change of heart so that now a different perspective is important to you. And the third one is beautiful because it describes a change of direction. That's conversion. It's not simply acknowledging that certain facts are true. It is in fact a revolution, literally. 360 degrees whereby a man or a woman is turned from pursuing sin and is now pursuing Christ they must have him they will not go on without him you don't have to force them to believe because they want him he's altogether lovely the Gentiles are turning to God and that was how the first century church operated in Luke chapter 24, you get the form of the Great Commission, 
where we are told that Jesus said to the disciples, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. That repentance and remission of sin. See how they go side by side? You realize you're on the wrong track. You realize you're on the wrong direction. You're on the broad way leading to destruction. And you say, I'm not staying here. How can I get out? Jesus says, I am the door. <coughs> by me, if any man enters in, he, she shall be saved. And that's the glory of the gospel. That's what's sometimes forgotten today. It seems to have slipped into the background. But it is the message of Jesus. Matthew 4, 17. After he's baptized, these are the words of Jesus as he preaches. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now the truth is, men and women of themselves cannot repent. It, mean, it, it, it requires that there be a supernatural work of God in their life. And they need a new heart. They need a new perspective. But the gospel is such that, that God is willing to give it. Back in John 16, when the Lord is explaining the, the work of the Holy Spirit after he's left, he says in verse 8, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. He'll persuade men and women they're sinners. And of righteousness. That God is holy, that God is righteous. And worse than that, and of judgment. When you see that you're to meet God... And you're not fit to meet him. Then there should be a cry from your heart. Lord save me. And that's a cry God never ignores. Because it means. That you can now see what you formerly didn't see. You now want what, what was once. A matter of indifference to you. We were in Helmsley yesterday afternoon. And I was struck. We were trying. Conducting a survey. I was struck by the number of people that told me I was wasting my time. And you told them it was a survey of faith and radio. Oh, you're wasting your time with me. I don't have any time for that. I started putting little black marks on my bit of paper to count them and gave up. Because we live in a day and an age when people no longer understand, understand they're in the wrong direction. There's a, 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 an online movie, it's called Hell's Best Kept Secret. And it's by a man called Ray Comfort who lives in Los Angeles or somewhere around there, yeah? far off part of the world. Um, and, and in that he, he makes a very, a very salient point. He says, if when passengers were boarding an aeroplane they were given a parachute, they would say, what am I getting this for? Why do I need this? Where can I put this? And that would be especially worse if after a few journeys there had been no need for it. It would become an encumbrance. But Comfort explains in that film, let there once be an alarm from the pilot. Let there once be an indication that the plane is going to crash. What will everybody want? <coughs> you see, our present generation has been lulled into a state of, of ignorance and indifference. And because they sit there in their ignorance and indifference, they don't even realize they need the gospel. Oh dear friends, we need to cry out to, to God for a change in our day and age. A change which is brought about by sowing the word, watering the word, and crying to God for the increase. Because those kind of people are the real church of Jesus Christ. No matter what, can I use the word denominational title, they might hang over their head. The real church are people who've been converted. And so James guides us then. What is the nature of a church? I'm not going to brag, but one of the characteristics of our little congregation is it's what's called a gathered church. It's a coming together of people who have confessed their sinners, who've seen the need of the God's parachute, and are using it doesn't seem right to compare Christ to God's parachute, but please understand the analogy. 
They fled to Christ. They're trusting Christ and they want to meet other people. We're only too happy for non-Christians to come in because we think if they see what we've got, they'll want it. But that's the nature of a gospel church. My heart broke yesterday as I spoke to a 70-ish old man from, from Great Aiton, he told me he was. And he had no time for the gospel. He was quite outspoken and rubbish there. And he says, I believe in reincarnation. And he says, you know, if reincarnation is true, I want to come back as a bacon sandwich. He says, because then I'd be eaten and reincarnated and eaten and reincarnated. I thought, how does somebody who's lived in these, this country for so long even begin to talk like that? And there was no changing his mind. Dear friends, let's understand that the true church is a congregation that has been transformed by the grace of God and they then are gracious. They're willing to deny self for the sake of the gospel. Twice in this passage, James explains what should be said to the Gentiles in Antioch. You find it there in verse 20. He says, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogue every Sabbath. Then run your eye down to verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us to lay upon them, upon you, no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well, fare well. What's happening here is, this is the solution to the debate that's going on. And you, you need, if you can, to use a time machine and transfer yourself back 2,000 years. These Jews have had circumcision and these laws since the time of Mount Sinai probably around 1400 BC. So for nigh on 1500 years, these things had been what made them who they were. Now I find myself as a Scotsman in England. There are things from my past that are not practiced in England. One of the, the comical things is eating haggis. Ask an Englishman to eat haggis or women and you immediately see the alarm bells going on. We were brought up on it. And it's still a delight to have such things. But that's cultural. That's what identifies me as a Scotsman. No, that's one of the things that identifies me as a Scotsman. You've not got time for a list of the rest of them. That's one of the things. And, and really what's being realized here is that since real conversion is this transformation that takes place inside people, then there are going to be things which are cultural, which are habitual, which may have a good foundation in the past, which are no longer our first priority. Now this is a very difficult area to get your head round, but it's important that you do. That this is not just what the church says, but this is what God says and thinks. And that comes from verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. This is not just people compromising because they're a bunch of softies or they want to, to, to achieve something in their own strength. This is, this is God leading the church. How different church history would have been if these things had prevailed. We watched the film on Luther here on Tuesday night. And poor old Martin Luther never really realized what he was doing, they said. He put up those 95 theses, and his idea was that the Roman Catholic Church would listen to him, and they would change back to what they should have been. But apparently, and I hadn't noticed it before, with the rise of the printing press, other people took his 95 theses, they printed them, and they circulated them. So in some ways, it got out of hand. And Luther was then finally caught up with it. A very inadequate uh, explanation. Ask me to borrow the film. It's well worth watching. Um, but how, how often church history has been distinguished by people pursuing their own goals and their own name. 
we need to understand that there's a difference between what you're used to, what you prefer, to what's involved in being a Christian. The Holy Spirit, remember, was promised to the church by the Lord Jesus. John 16, 13. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. You have a whole chapter in, in John's Gospel, don't you? John 17, where the Lord Jesus is praying for unity among his brethren. And not just for the ones that were on earth at the time, but for the ones that would come in the future. And so there's a real challenge here to understand, to grow, to develop. Because when you're converted, you're not converted as a mature Christian. The Bible calls us babes in Christ. What do we understand about babies? They need to be looked after, they need to be fed, they need to grow, they need to develop. And so every Christian is in this process of developing, a development which will not be complete until we see Christ and we're actually like him. So the whole of my life here is one in which I'm to be developing in love toward God for his grace and developing in grace towards his people because of his love for us all together. There's a little verse in Philippians 3, 15, which caught my attention. You know, that's the chapter where Paul says he thought being a, a Pharisee was a whole bunch of rubbish. Toward the end of that chapter, verse 15, he says, Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. There's, there's, there's clearly a perception of growing and developing and understanding. And one of the primary areas of that growth is in understanding who it is that's a Christian and what it is that's vital to Christianity. These four guidelines given here can be taken right back to the book of Leviticus, chapter 17 and chapter 18. That's where they come from. A, a, a principal part of the law revealed by God through Moses. The book of Leviticus is the book of holiness, the book of being distinct and set apart. And in that book, they were exhorted not to participate in the idol sacrifices of the pagan nations. And that then became something which was important to the Jews. They were exhorted not to participate in sexual immorality. You know, the commandment says you shall not commit adultery. Leviticus 18 goes into more detail. And it's from books like, parts like Leviticus 18 that we find the Bible's teaching on things like homosexuality and others. It's not just a modern problem. It's been a problem as long as men and women have been around. And what we need to do is to understand what's pleasing to God rather than ourselves. Meat, strangled, animals strangled rather than, than the meat strangled, but animals strangled and their blood not drained out. Leviticus 17.12 makes a very clear point that life is in the blood and that that life was to be used in a sacrifice to God, not to be consumed by human beings. And then blood itself is mentioned. The Old Testament is quite clear that it was not to be eaten by Jews. These four things would be part of what distinguished a Jew from a Gentile. In actual fact, if you've got time to read the books, you'll find that the Gentiles were the very opposite. They, they gorged themselves in these things. They indulged themselves in immorality. So that the Gentiles who had become Christians would have to give up some things. The Jews who had become Christians would have to cool off on their demands on others. So that here is a call together for compromise, a call together to make the, the fact that we are all believers together because God has turned us from sin to himself. 
Now, at, at no point is there a compromise on the central doctrine of the scripture. The men are sinners, women are sinners too, in case you, you think you're the exception. That Christ died for sinners, and it's only through trusting Christ's atoning death as a substitution for your own that your sins are forgiven. And that you now are indwelled by the Holy Spirit to be righteous. These things are not negotiable. But when it comes to that which is the practice, can I say, of history, the practice of family, the practice of your culture and upbringing, then you really do need to come back and say, does this or that make me or stop me being a Christian? Is this a hindrance to other people? There's a pattern in the New Testament which needs to be picked up and it begins here at the end of the book of Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. It says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. That's lovely, isn't it? If it is possible, as much as depends on you, that brings you right into the framework. It lays it at your door. It says it's your business. And then at the end of Hebrews, you get these lovely words in 12, 14. <coughs> Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. It's our business to get on together. And when you put together a bunch of Christians who come from different countries and different cultures, you have to understand there are going to be different things that are important to those individuals. But what joins us is bigger than all of them. It was obviously a great delight to the disciples that this was what was to happen. We are told in 1614 of Acts, And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. They told us, they spoke about this in every church. It's, it's so basic and so substantial an issue for all of us. We're, we're all wrestling with it. And we need to be honest with each other. And talk these things through. We need to expect to compromise. Not to have things done my way because I like it. You know that song by... Frank Sinatra, isn't it? I did it my way. As I was writing this, I thought, we need to, to recognise whether you like it or not. That is no part of what goes on in the church. You don't come in and say, oh, I'm going to sort this bunch out. They're not doing it my way. We'll soon fix that. There could be good reasons. There will be differences amongst us on the way we dress, on the food we eat, on the liquids we drink. On the habits that are important to us, the kind of hymns that we sing, the order of our church services, whether you wear a hat or not, and in days gone by, whether the ladies should wear lipstick and trousers. There's a whole list, isn't there? Which actually don't change whether you're a believer or not. Which actually don't impinge upon whether your brother and sister in Christ is a believer or not. They might need to learn some things, but it doesn't stop them being believers and one of the challenges as i read this is the impression that we've given to the world isn't it i met a man in pickering who had looked at our website and he didn't come to our church because it looked too much like a brethren church i thought what but that's what he saw and he thought we would all be so straight laced and somber and and and, and unpleasant that he wasn't coming and he still hasn't come. I've met him since then. But he still hasn't come. People are odd. And we need to apologise then to anybody we've driven off. Ask their forgiveness. And maybe even to the unconverted people that we know. Have we really centred on the gospel of the life, death and resurrection of Christ? Or have we given them the impression that we need to, that to become a Christian you also need to take on board our baggage? That's what's happening here. Oh, the world needs to see the joy of being a Christian. And that's where I'm going to get to to finish. I love this passage as I read it. And the more I read it, the more excited I got. Verse 30. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. Dun, dun, dun. Sorry, I can do that, should I? 
You know what I mean. Climax. They delivered the letter. And then the church in Antioch, when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. That's when the Gospels have worked, you see. When what happens as we work with each other as believers, when we strive to build each other up, then the joy of the Lord becomes ours. The grace of God, which is seen in such a variety of people, becomes obvious. And can I say the church then becomes attractive? Because when Christians are enjoying the Lord that shows in their lives, notice, now Judas and Silas themselves being prophets, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. You see, the blessing came to Antioch and it went back to Jerusalem. But it didn't stop there. Verse 35, Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. And it's the next little phrase that caught my attention, with many others also. There has to have been a revival in that church for that to be true. There has to have been an amazing work of God in that church for that to be true. People were excited at knowing that God's grace was theirs, that God loved them, and that God then was going to bless them beyond comparison they rejoiced over its encouragement they didn't need to go under the knife they didn't need to check where, what food they were eating they didn't need to, to check whether they had clothes that were make, made of mixed fibers or not you know th these are just three instances that come to mind from from old testament judaism they didn't have to worry about whether they could put their false teeth in on a on a sabbath and that was one of the sabbatical laws in Israel. You had to put them in the day before because if you arrived on the Sabbath with your false teeth out, you went the whole day without them. They were so meticulous. No, they are delighted. They are enjoying the liberty of being Christians. They are experiencing again and again by their... Uh, uh, experience of the grace of God at work in their brothers and sisters they're experiencing the wonderful grace that God brings you can almost hear them cheering wonderful fabulous oh they want us to leave those things aside that's no problem we want them to be with us we long for them to be part of us And then, dear friends, there's a message, as I said, to take back to the church in Jerusalem. As they are further instructed, as they're developed, exhorted and strengthened, verse 32 says, as the word of God is laid before them, as the wonder of a God who loves me and gave himself for me is, is explained to them, then, then what happens is their hearts just get bigger and bigger, their lives are transformed, and their church becomes a place that is an attractive place to unbelievers, isn't it? Oh, dear friend, what a, a desire there is in my heart for such a supernatural e explosion of the gospel in our days. I, I read a book last week, or a part of a book, and it was talking about evangelism. And it, and it said something which was so obvious, but I hadn't really taken it on board before. And he says, you can make your whole congregation feel guilty about their need to be evangelizing. You can lay it on the line that every Christian has a duty to speak about Christ. You can burden them with the responsibility that they must speak to the next person. And if they don't, they just get guiltier and guiltier. All he says, you can, you can explain the wonder of the gospel. And as they catch the thrill of the gospel, as they catch the wonder of being loved, as they... Uh, Catch the, the, the blessing of being part of a, a living, dynamic congregation. He says, then they will evangelize. It is a duty. But if only a duty, it's a burden. It's a delight to be able to talk to somebody about the wonderful, wonderful love of Jesus. And I am absolutely persuaded, 110%, 
that that's what the New Testament expects us to see. And that's exactly what you get here in this passage. Remember Ephesians 5.18, when the Holy Spirit's present, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. People want to be filled with the Spirit, but understand what their outcome is. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that might not be your temperament, but if you're in Christ, it needs to be your goal. It needs to be where you would like to be, and not just in five years' time. My prayer daily is that God would make me so aware of the wonder of his love to this old sinner, that I'll be ready to share it with anybody that comes across my path and will listen to me. And I pray that I won't just be doing it because I have to, because I'm the minister, because it's expected of me. If you've got good news, it really should be good news, isn't it? And that's what you see here in this church. A time of revival. You see, Christianity is, is, is better caught than taught, somebody cleverly said. It should be like the, the flu. Spread through society. Watch when revival comes. It starts with just one or two, and then before you know what's what, there's a whole community saved. I like to, uh, to refer to what happened in Rosedale 150 years ago. Little old Thomas Langton, the farrier, who had become an itinerant preacher. Travelling the moors, went to Rosedale, a community then of over 2,000 miners. He had, he had worked as hard as he could to preach the gospel to them. And after their, 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 their church service, he, he called on men and women to come to Christ. And nothing happened. So the women of the church, thank God for godly women, began praying. And it says in the little book, it's so inadequate, I wish somebody else would give us all the details. It said, as they were praying, the men were drawn back into the chapel one by one. They were under conviction by God. They were on that road of repentance. They wanted peace with God through Christ and hallelujah, they found it. So that the majority of these rough Cornish miners came to faith in Christ. Oh, you say that was a long time ago. I'll say to you, yes, it was too long ago. It's time it was back. I'm not going to put a burden on you. I'm not going to manipulate you guiltily. I'm going to say, friends, somewhere there's a block in the pipeline. And something of getting rid of that block is catching again. The vision of the wonder of God's love for us as sinners, the grace of God provided by Christ as our Saviour. And, and, and I would almost say, I defy you not to speak about it. You remember what it was like when you were first converted? That's how it's supposed to be every day. That's how it should be every day. What was it that got you excited back then? You knew He loved you. You rejoiced in his grace to you. You were amazed that he was so good to you. And if somebody happened to rub shoulders with you, they would hear about him. Oh dear friends, my prayer is that God would bring such days to our churches again and to this church. Not only for our enjoyment of it, but let's remember there's such a multitude of people around us who are unbelievers. And in their indifference, they think they're right. I used to love R.E. when I was at school, a man said to me yesterday. I like studying all the religions in the world, but I'm not sure if any of them's real. Huh? I pray he's away home thinking. That's the world you live in. I, I, I was shocked yesterday in Helmsley. The number of folks who just brush it off. 
And it came home to me, the world I'm living in. What's God's plan to change that? They're sitting in your seat and mine. And I don't want you just to do it because it's the right thing. That would be me moving you. I want you to do it because God set your heart on fire again. And you would just love to see him glorified. Because that's the gracious gospel. It's a gospel which is for the unbeliever. It's a gospel which is for the world. It's a gospel which can, which can transform a life in a minute and bring glory to God. Oh, that you would not only know the gospel of grace, but that you and I would know the grace of the gospel. Amen. Thank you.